Hey everybody, Nerd or Doug from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds here at the live chat while Nerdark is Dave and Ted are away at PAX Unplugged with Nate the Nerdark. Um, so if you're looking, if you're at PAX Unplugged and I gotta mute my tab that I forgot. So let's turn that off. Problem, hurdle number one, overcome. But anyways, yeah, they're at PAX Unplugged. <laughs> so if you see them on the floor come up and say hi um also uh we're still doing the xanathar's guide to everything contest you can get either the special edition or standard edition um contest running for the next seven days and you can go to any of the xanathar's guide flip through videos and there's a link to that there's also a link on the website for that and today i am hanging out with Seth Skorkowski. He is an author, gamer. He's got a really cool YouTube channel, and you can find all the links to that stuff in the description below and his Twitter, so you can follow him on there. So uh, how are you doing today, Seth? I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No problem. Happy to uh, have you on the show. Um, so you just recently uh, posted your most recent video this morning. I know we were talking a little, uh, and I saw online that you had a, you know, weren't sure if you should just press the button and get it over with or keep to the schedule. So uh, wh what is your newest video this morning? Um, I did the Call of Cthulhu scenario cold warning. It was a recent Kickstarter by Golden Goblin. Oh, nice. uh, I, I managed to hold off until today to post it. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, um, you know, you're probably – uh, very well known, obviously, for your books. Um, how many how many uh, novels have you written now? I have, I have uh, three novels that are in print. That's with my Valdican series. It's kind of a, a modern day monster hunter. It's like a Hellboy or supernatural. And the fourth book is coming out on Audible in January, into January. And then I do uh, two collections of pulpy sword and sorcery thief adventures. Oh, cool. uh, I like to compare a lot to uh, Grey Mauser sort of stuff. So I have two books of that. Yeah, that reminds me, I think I read somewhere, it's probably in your bio, that that was like your first big introduction to fantasy with Fritz Lieber's Pfeiffer and the Grey Mauser stuff. That's something I've enjoyed many times over the years. So uh, you tell us about that. Well, um, you know, I, yeah, so I, I started with uh, Dungeons and Dragons, like probably most of us did, uh, about 13. Then I was going to the little comic and game shop. And they had the uh, AD&D Linkmar City of Adventure book. And it's just this cover of them on the street. You know, Fawfer and a Great Mauser, you can see up this alley behind them. And just something about that that cover image, like, really grabbed me. So I picked it up and I read it. And those books hadn't been in print for years at that time. And, you know, I was in a little East Texas town. I couldn't find them very easily. So by the time I finally got to the Fawfer and a Great Mauser stories, I had the entire city of Linkmar mapped in my head. Like, I... I had memorized it pretty much because, you know, there's that young nerd obsession, you know, where you, you go through the map to the point that you, you, you know, it. so you read the book and they talk about, they go on this street and they turned here and you're like, I know exactly where they are. And you pull out my D and D map and follow them. So, uh, it's something I love, but I kind of came at it through the back door versus falling in love with the stories first. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, so that would be cool to read the books and think, like, I know exactly where they're at on my map. And, you know, um, so it, it, did you run a lot of games in that setting then, or, or do you still? I uh, I ran a few games with Lankmar. They did, uh, there was a big Nuhan campaign that was a bunch of different adventures that took you around the world, and then a, a few adventures in the city. I've then, for tons of games, just stolen parts of Lankmar and were kind of shoehorned that into my own world. Uh, so I've, I've probably done that more than actually running official Lankmar, where it's like, well, I'm going to take this Slayer's Brotherhood from, from the map, and I'm going to drop it in my town, and I'm going to take this and drop that. So I, I've used it a lot, just not officially as much as um, yeah. I probably should have. You know, that's what all, all DMs do. You just steal liberally. So like, it's funny when my friends would be like, you should publish this setting. It's like, well, I'd probably have to get licensing rights from like 50 <laughs> different places. You know, it's just like my creation is just like my own mishmash of the stuff that I like from other things. Yeah, I've, I've done that. I've, I, uh, before I started playing Call of Cthulhu, which is my current poison, I did a. Uh, I made my own rule book for our guys. We had this home game. It was uh, using the cyberpunk interlock system, and for the rule book, 
I stole from so many different game systems to make it. Now people are like, God, you should publish this. It's like, oh God, no, yeah. no, no, no one else at my table will ever see this because you guys think I'm a genius, but I'm, I'm just a massive thief. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, every, 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 all the all DMs there, man. Oh yeah. Um, one thing I to go back to your books series now. The thing that pops out to me is there's a, a sentience uh, pistol is one of the yeah. characters have. That sounds interesting. Is that like a, a main character of the series? Um, yeah, it, it is a character. Um, so that book came about through a bunch, you know, no, no book comes about from one idea. It's about 12 ideas that you're like, oh, these work together. Um, it came from, you know, D&D. &D. Uh, a magic sword makes a lot of sense in fantasy. You know, the blade is magic. You need to hit the demon that requires magic, hits it. So then it was like, well, how did a gun work? Because the gun doesn't hit it. So I went through all the process of, you know, getting each bullet to work. And then at the same time, I had a separate idea about uh, uh, how demons would would work with uh, werewolves and vampires, where it was just a demonic possession versus a virus, that sort of deal. And uh, so the, the gun I named Dameron, that became the title of the first book. And then each book follows a different protagonist in this kind of group of monster hunters, and they're all named after their weapon that is oh, okay it's a, a sentient weapon each of them has like a superpower but uh they're kind of like non-speaking roles mm -hmm. you know like a, yeah i guess like a, a stormbringer and elric you know, stormbringer is a massive character but it's, you know, it's the sword right uh, so or in you know far from a great mauser they had their mm -hmm. their weapons that everybody knew their names but at the same time they were you know they were loved characters but they weren't running around doing stuff right oh, so okay so the title of the book i actually was a little like it's got that umlaut so i don't want to mispronounce it <laughs> uh okay so if you ever wanted to go into publishing for any reason do not ever put an umlaut in your title uh <laughs> my my editor i thought was gonna like just knife me because <laughs> you know it looked i put it in because it looked cool and i and i wanted it to have a very uh, you know non you know english look to it and uh, but then when it comes time, because we're in electronic media, where you you're trying to post it on Amazon or Goodreads or Barnes and Noble, nobody knows how to type an umlaut. <laughs> and you know, so it's like, well, we're gonna have to just reuse a regular A because otherwise the searches won't work. And you know, they're like, and every time we have to, you have to write the name out, you have a you have this this umlaut that you do in the book, and it's like. Well, guys, I'll, I'll tell you the secret is I, I literally just taught my computer to just auto change that for me. I don't know how to do the, 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 the key thing to get the <laughs> yeah. out. Just Microsoft Word's like, I know what you're doing. I got this. And I'm like, okay. But people would ask, like, what is that alt two seven something? Like, no, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Whenever I hit I, it, I, just I, makes I, a bunch I, of twos and sevens. <laughs> that's awesome. So, but that's. That's uh, that's kind of been the, the big passion for a few years is working on that series. So. Yeah, and uh, kind of. Uh, do you have a, an, another one in the works now? An excellent um, series, or, I, or you have you also have your Black Raven series, right? Yeah, the Black Raven is my uh, my thief stuff, and and those were like the old pulps. Uh, you could literally pick up any story, and very quickly you know hmm. who these characters are and what to do. Uh, I, I kind of compare it to you back in the day when uh, you know, before TV was like it was all soap operas like it is now. Yeah, you, know, you could you could start an episode of MacGyver having never seen MacGyver before in your life, and in about three minutes you're like, okay, I know what's going on, and you can follow it. And then like then you can catch a random episode another week, and you don't feel like you missed anything. Mm -hmm. And you know they don't have to even be in order, and you're you're fine with it. So. That series is kind of like that. We, we've put them in an order that is linear, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be. And yeah. I tell readers, like, man, if you get one that you don't like, you can just skip to the next one. It's not like you're like, oh, I have to muscle through this so I can you know, know what's going on. Um, but as far as my next book, I'm currently querying a completely different uh, novel. I'm doing a dark portal fantasy. So I'm... Trying to go through the whole process of getting an agent and publisher, and uh, that's the that is that <laughs> the is business the trial. Side of it. Oh, 
Well, yeah, the problem is uh, the business side of it is the hardest part for the creative types because you're in absolute control as you're writing it. And then when it comes time to the, you know, pitching it and trying to write it to sell it, it's like it's a different part of your brain. And it's usually yeah. the underdeveloped part of your brain <laughs> because you've, you've really developed the creative wordsmithy type. And then you have somebody go, can you summarize your you know, 150,000 word book in one sentence? You're like, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> Do you know how complex this story is? Oh, yeah, all these subplots and all this stuff. And like, give it to me in one sentence. Like, that's impossible. So you have to like kind of start working on this part of your brain that you have neglected as you've been doing being creative. And that is, uh, uh, it's, that's the painful part. So I'm curious, uh, so as a gamer yourself, and I was thinking this when you were talking about the Black Raven series, and it kind of made me think, like, well, that's kind of the way, like, classic D&D was. It was epi more pulpy and episodic like that. You know, I mean, we when, when we were kids, we just, like, you're at the dungeon entrance. So, you know, it didn't matter, like, how you got there. Or, like, what interpersonal relationships did we develop on the way? So, like, what kind of uh, gaming do you prefer? Do you, do you like that style? Or do you, you know, are modern people, like, these big narrative things or a little bit of both or what? I, I, I mix it up. Um, I yeah, I grew up doing you know the old adventures like White Plume Mountain, where it's like it's literally just the dungeon, and you've got like two paragraphs mm -hmm. to kind of explain why in the hell you would be here. Or like you know, Tomb of Horrors, there's never even an explanation given. It's just like get up and start you're at the hill, dig, start digging. <laughs> and uh, so and that's how I played for a long time, and then when I got to college and. You know, my, my players wanted story and motivation and all that crap, and then I got into it. But uh, we've done long-running campaigns that had a big, intricate plot. Uh, but I also just, I love just the Adventure of the Week style sometimes, where it's like, you know, you've got the same characters, and you've got their own thing. But say, like, okay, well, now Mulder and Scully are, are going off to Kansas to fight the bug monster. And, you know, next week we're in Los Angeles. So, you know, uh, those have a lot of appeal to me, uh, mostly because I, I get the attention span issue where if, if I'm going to be dedicating a year of my life to one story, at some point in there, I'm going to be like, man, once this is done, I can't wait to do this other thing and then this other thing. And then I kind of start, yeah, I might start shortening the campaign so I can get to whatever <laughs> my next day is. My players hate this about me. So if I can kind of keep it, you know, this week we're doing this, and this week your character's doing this, but they get to keep the same characters, and we can kind of, you know, kind of lace them together into one longer thing. That's my preferred, but so that's that's kind of the curse when you're, you're very creatively minded, is very quickly you come mm -hmm. up with the next thing you want to do, and uh, players uh, hate that. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I know. it's I have the same problem. It's like, uh, and for me, I don't, like... A lot of my people I play with have, you know, kids and everything, so it's like different people will show up all the time, and I usually end up DMing, and, but they want to, like, have this continuing thing. It's like, do you guys know how hard that is when, like, you know, three of you don't show up one week? So it's like, there is no narrative to continue, You're like, in the middle of a arc or whatever. Oh, but, well, uh, and, you know, your, your buddy at the last moment is like, oh, I got, you know, my kid's sick, I can't make it. It's like, that's cool, you know, life happens. You were the entire like <laughs> yeah. foundation for this game. So let me kind of quickly throw something together. So the, the, the people that do come to the game have a reason to do the adventure. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of times people like, you know, if, if they've got a game where everybody makes it every time, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, right. I know. <laughs> for the rest of us, it's like, well, you know, so-and-so got called into work, and so-and-so, you know, has, has this going on, and you're kind of sitting there going, okay, I'm going to have somewhere between two and seven people uh, at today's <laughs> game, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, it occurred to me, too, like, you know, being a writer, and so your normal everyday life is concerned with, like, you know, constructing a narrative and keeping it going, so it's for for you, probably gaming as escapism is like I don't want to think about all that. It's like I like you'd mentioned White Plum Mountain. It's like just give me that. We're at here. Somebody stole these magic weapons. The king hired us to get them back. So it's not like, well, what's my motivation for being here? Like maybe I don't want to get the weapons back from White Plum Mountain. It's like nope, that's the dungeon. Like we're just going in. It's, yeah, um, and I it was a 
as with Tomb of Horrors, it was the first time I ever had that true like, like, why are we here? What's our motivation? It's like, it's the, it's the freaking dungeon. It's called the Tomb like, of Horrors. <laughs> and uh, they're like, no, we don't want to do it. Like, what the hell? And uh, so, yeah, uh, now I make sure that they've got plenty of motivation, but there is still uh, kind of the house rule of like, like, I don't, I will give you a reason. I will try to make it a good reason. I will, I will work with your character, but ultimately you're going in the damn dungeon. <laughs> yeah. If you don't I like guess. the reason I gave you, you need to come up with some way for your character to interpret that, that they'll go, <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll, we'll go in. Because otherwise, we all got together so we could play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <It's> like, <laughs> this is the adventure. <laughs> your character is supposed to be an adventure. Although, I guess, yeah, from a motivation standpoint, you know, you'd think, like, if, if you were a character in that world, like, hey, let's go to the Tomb of Horrors. There's treasure. They're like, I don't want to go to no place called Tomb of Horrors. Let's go to, like, Tomb of Bountiful Gold. Let's, yeah, let's do that too. The, the Tomb of Kittens. That's that <laughs> and there, um, there was a one one guy. Uh, it was an editor. His name was Lou Andrews. Was talking about a, a book series, and I wish I could remember its name right now. That was basically about what what D and D characters would really be like. Like, what sort of personality is it? Where you know you're you're, you're sitting in the town. You're like. You know what I think we should do is let's just get together, go in that cave and just murder families of goblins. Just just wholesale slaughter entire families of goblins. Like mm-hmm. what sort of people would these really these heroes really Yeah, you're be not like? you're not that nice often. <laughs> like if they yeah, and it's usually just for gold, you know, like some person in the town's just like, Hey, I tell you what, like I'll pay you twenty five gold if you go like kill all these hobgoblins. Why? Well, because we want we want the the land they're living on. Like, oh, okay, that's good. Man, we'll just go in there and slaughter them all. Yeah, there's a, there's a bit of moral ambiguity. When you start <laughs> it's like, but they're it. goblins. It's like, well, okay, yeah, but let's think about this. Yeah. <laughs> so now I noticed uh, in your when you were talking a moment ago, you kind of slipped into your barbarian voice from your videos, and that's uh, one thing I wanted to mention about the videos, and especially that like, a is that somebody that's in your group that you know, kind of has that demeanor and be, um, yeah, like, you know, these, if people haven't seen your videos, like, uh, Seth does a lot of like sketches and stuff with costumes and, and different voices, which is really fun. Um, and so can you talk about like how you started getting into that? Um, most of the voices are, are, are mine that, uh, a lot of them started with bad impersonations. I, I talked to a lot of voices. I can't do a good impersonation to save my life. So they just kind of become my interpretation. <laughs> and if they can, and usually it requires me telling them who I'm impersonating. Uh, there, there is one character that I do on the show that is a player that has this very surfer voice. And I stole that from one of my players who... <laughs> who had a, a half-orc barbarian that sounded like Sean Penn Spicoli. <laughs> and when he unleashed that character on the group, it took us a long time to like recover because it was so funny that, that we would just let him talk and we would stop playing. We were just like, I just let him go because he's hilarious. And then she's like, okay, okay, let's get to the adventure. So when I was trying to come up with a voice to make sure all my characters are different, I'm like, I am totally stealing uh, the 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 Dante the surfer barbarian voice because that that is too good. Um, the rest of them, I, I don't know. There's the Jack the NPC voice that I kind of compare to um, uh, Doctor Girlfriend from the Venture Brothers mixed with Buster Poindexter. <laughs> uh, you ever saw Scrooge when he was the mm-hmm. ghost of Christmas Past yeah. like that? Oh yeah, come on this way. Yeah, I'm like I'll I'll do this voice. <laughs> Are those things you do in your games? Oh, by the way, uh, in the chat, True Mate, I think it's from Wales, uh, says, Love Seth's sketches. Looking forward to future characters. Hashtag surfer guy best. <laughs> so you got some fans um, in, the, in the chat today. I, I, I do have a lot of uh, voices that pop up in the game. Uh, and some of them are, there's kind of like generic, generic barman, you know, which my players have heard a million times. And then every once in a while you do you, you come up with a new one and that lit is just owned by that NPC till the day you die. You can never use it again. Uh, but you know, two of my players I've been playing with since uh, January of ninety nine. So they've wow. they, they've heard well, one of them I married, yeah. 
<laughs> so she is with me forever. And um, yeah, so there's certain NPC voices that years later I'll recycle that NPC and I'll shoehorn them in a completely different role in a new campaign where, you know, in, in one D&D campaign, the evil villain they spend a year trying to chase down and he's a bad and impersonation of Antonio Banderas in um, uh, it was an interview with a vampire, the, the, the vampire Lamont, Armand. Like, I know nothing of clueless and evil. Well, then, you know, two campaigns later, he's a, he's a bartender going by the exact same name, says a lot of the same stuff, but he's just this different guy. And then uh, the god Horus, the Egyptian god Horus, big hawk head, mm-hmm. I made him talk like the chicken lady. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do kids, or kids in the hall. And, uh, you know, then years later in a cyberpunk game, he was like the armor that, you know, <laughs> yeah, that sells them all of their, their weaponry before they do a job. And they go into like, you know, Horace Arms and there's this guy and he's just talking like that. And everyone's trying to keep a straight face. <laughs> it's like, wait, this is all the same little catchphrases. So, but yeah, some, some, some voices kind of do him resigned to a character till, you know, the end of time. Mm-hmm. So. Um, one of the other things I like about your videos is like, they're a lot of them are very nice, like broad advice for, you know, any role playing or even just any uh, editions of D and D. And I know I like to look at the backgrounds and people on videos. And I see you got some AD and D books back there, so you know, obviously you've been gaming a long time. What what uh, you know, are you playing fifth edition now, or, or just do you guys um, change right it up now, and stuff like that? Um, I am playing uh, Call of Cthulhu seventh edition. And, uh, more specific- is it still from Chaosium? Oh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, I had the original one. And more specifically, I'm doing kind of a bolt-on edition that's called Pulp Cthulhu. Oh, okay. And uh, so, you know, Call of Cthulhu, I, I love this system. I love skill-based system over um, class-based. And uh, uh, Pulp Cthulhu kind of beefs the characters up a little bit because, you know, Call of Cthulhu has a... You can you can easily slaughter your party, and I don't I don't like doing that because mm-hmm. it takes a long time to come up with a character, and once they have a good character, I'm like I want to keep them for a while. Uh, Pulp Cthulhu kind of takes that Lovecraft thing, and it's like it adds a little bit more Brendan Fraser's The Mummy to it, okay. or uh, or The Shadow, you know. So there's oh, okay. much more like there's weird science and all sorts of stuff. So it's much more. Um, you pull out two pistols and you start shooting the bad guy versus you just rip your face off and go insane. So, so it's kind of like adventures set in that world, but they that, that they don't all have to do with the elder chore per se, or like yeah. you know they're not all like Cthulhu is the big bad guy, and this might just be like some run of the mill cultists that you can. Yeah, and that's, so it's it's a lot more um, it's a lot more our style because. Yeah, as much as I love the detective and investigative and role play aspect of uh, of that game, you know, I I grew up playing D and D, man. Sometimes you just want some some wholesale slaughter. And uh, my one of my players who didn't really have the background of D and D like the rest of us did, because you know, he's the new guy. We've only had him for three years. And, <laughs> you know, so he. He still wants to do some dungeon crawling, and it's like, okay, we'll we'll do Pulp Cthulhu. That way, you can have some wholesale murder for a while, and I'm not sitting here the whole time going, oh god, oh god, they're all gonna die, they're all gonna die. I don't I don't want to have to like start over if they all get slaughtered because they for some reason they thought they could take this thing out. So that's been a lot more fun for us because it allows us to have some games that are slow and detective-y and others that are just, you know kill house and yeah if if we did the exact same thing every time i would become bored and my players would become bored and then we'd run off and do something else and game books cost a lot man i want to stick with one thing for a while (laughs) yeah i hear you so i'm I'm picking up that you're usually the game master uh almost (laughs) exclusively uh (laughs) i did a game with the um into the darkness podcast back in august and that was my first time to ever play Call of Cthulhu in my life. Uh, and then it was the first time to play a role-playing game as a player since 2011. So it was a lot of fun for me. I had a bit of a lag spike there. Oh, yeah, I meant to put a disclaimer at the beginning of the video. So I guess they're installing fiber optic cable 
or what uh, internet in my area today. So if the feed just cuts out immediately for no reason, that is probably why. And I, I think it just had a little snag there a moment ago. Mm. Froze up. So, but it looks like we're still live, so that's cool. Um, but uh, hey, it's twelve twenty-six here on my end, so uh, Eastern. So we're about halfway through. We can uh, go into the roll call. For the people in the chat, it looks like we got 43 people in the chat right now. So uh, while they're doing that, um, uh, one thing oh, I, that's right, I wanted to ask you about, especially speaking of players dying and everything, my group wants me to want to play Curse of Strad, and I've never run that before, but I know you're a big Ravenloft fan. You have a few review videos of the original module, and I'm assuming you've played Curse of Strad. So you got any uh, advice for me? We're starting with Death yet. House. I haven't done Curse yet. I uh... Uh, I, I picked it up and read it before my I did my review of the original Ravenloft module of like that. Okay, how much has this changed? And uh, the part of it that is the Ravenloft module is almost the same. They made a few tiny changes. They were for the better. But yeah, they pretty much took the, the map of Barovia and they blew it up. You know, huge. They added all this other stuff. So advice I could give, man... I don't know. You got a lot of reading to do. Yeah, yeah, uh, I've read it several times, um, and I watched your video about Ravenloft because, uh, like, again, you know, it's not, it was just good general advice about like how to be atmospheric and stuff. So I'm like, I got to get all the tips I can for this. I um, that is that's a, a very big mood game, mm-hmm. and at, at the time it came out, it was really groundbreaking. Uh, I also get really into the history of a lot of the older games because there, there's this evolution. You know, gamers that come in now, they might think, well, it was always like that. It's like, nah, man, when, when we had a game that wasn't uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, Tolkien knockoff, which you know, most of them were at that time, and, I, and it's this mood game with a villain that actually moves around, it's like, that was, that was wow at the time. Mm. Now, it's, now it's normal. Uh, but definitely do the letters. Like I actually wrote them out. Um, go to like a, a, a little hobby shop, like a Michaels or something, and actually wax seal them. That okay. way they can, they can break the, the wax themselves. And uh, uh, I did resume paper for the good letter, like you know, nice, nice thick resume paper. And then I took a Manila envelope for the second one. You know, it was brown and those big ones. So I cut that out and wrote it out there. So I, I love props. Uh, my my players kind of end up with folders full of handouts that I've given them. But, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I love I love handing them stuff that they can hold and, and play with. Mm-hmm. So, and then in that one, yeah, they recommend kind of turn the lights down low enough, you know, they can still see their stuff. But then uh, some electric candles. And I say electric because if you have open flame near your D and D books, you know, good luck. And uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, me and my players are really clumsy, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't trust myself near. Yeah, that. right. So, um, but now it's a fun one. I, I love that one. So he and, moved uh, around in the original one too, huh? Because I, I did get my Taroka deck. Okay. Do uh, the. Uh, you know, the actual oh, reading, I which I, I thought that was pretty cool. That's like, you know, where he is and where the items are and what the NPC is that can help you. So was that stuff in the original also? Oh, yeah. To some extent. It was, yeah, they, uh, it, was, it was really cool because it was like, you know, they, they draw the cards and you get really into the whole thing. So before you run the game, you decide what all those things are and you kind of have it on a post-it now. And then when they draw the cards, that overrides what you did. So... You do it in okay. advance in case that for some reason they'd never go see Madame Eva. Oh, and you're okay. like, damn it, guys, you're missing out one of the coolest <laughs> things ever. And you're like, no, we're going to Ravenloft now. And like, you see a gypsy camp down the hill. Screw them, we're going to Ravenloft. Like, <laughs> you know, the best thing about it is the people in my group, they're fairly new. So, like, they don't, you know, they don't know all about Ravenloft or Strad or like the mist. So I'm like, Oh, that'll be even much more fun to like, yeah, you go on to camp for the night and it's misty. And you know, they like experienced players should be like, Oh, you know, I know what that is, but they have no idea. So the, um, that should be cool. The original had it where like that mist, if you tried to leave it with poison. Hmm. Yeah. And now and, it, it, it kills you pretty quick now. You get exhaustion well, now it, every round. It, now it like kind of like sends you back in at least yeah. instead of just straight up murders you, which that was a solution I had. So then I, I went and I read the new one like, 
God damn, they came up with a two, but good. They came up with that too. Cause yeah, I like that. Idea. Wasn't that good. Yeah, it's slander when you come back in. But I think it says if you stay in it, you get like exhaustion every round. So it's like you die pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, you know, adds up. So let's go check the roll call, see where everybody is. We've got staff writer and author herself, Megan Miller. She's in Ohio at the butt crack. We've got Lincoln in Sweden. John Brogan in Jacksonville, Florida. Jason Darby in Las Vegas, Nevada. We got Patrick from Sweden. Virgilio in Utah. We got Ranger One in Sacramento, California. Shalandor in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We got True Mate in Wales, UK. John McLaughlin is here from Granite City, Illinois. Tucker Authors from Montana. We got AJ Kinney in Lopez Island. Geek and Undies is in Circleville, Ohio, and just jumped on me, so I got to scroll back up. Uh, Vamp Jaeger or Jaeger? I'm gonna say Jaeger because it sounds cool. Salt Lake City, Utah. Fast Sniper Fox in Nottingham, England. We got Sean Jones from Santa Barbara, California. Jeremy Hochalter in Fort Collins, Colorado. S let's see, Stitch Heel Chemist in Las Vegas, Nevada. Satori Shin is atop White Plume Mountain. Got past the Manticore and everything. Curtis Haynes in Flower Mound, Texas. That's where you're from. Oh, I know right? Curtis well. Oh, okay. Hey, Curtis. Kit Kat is... Nah, it's just, she's just asking a question. What is this? I've never been on this before. This is a live chat with author and YouTuber and gamer Seth Skorkowski. We do this every day live uh, at noon, Monday through Friday. Not with Seth, but with different people. Uh, let's see... We got Dristen Ross the Seventh in Sweden, Uber Clayton in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, Mickey V in Boynton Beach, Florida. We got Fergal in Ireland, High Priest of the Jovial in Brazil, Cranes One Two Three in Tifton, Georgia, Kit Kat in Michigan. We got Sean Orwin in Fort Lauderdale. I got a uh, congratulations on my good pronunciation. You're welcome, Jeremy. And Voice of Man in Bay Area, California. It's 43 people. So thanks, everybody, for spending your Friday with me while the uh, Nerd Arky Cruise away at PAX Unplugged. And um, I guess speaking of conventions, do you, do you make it to many conventions, uh, any big or small uh, ones? Well, I do uh, I do a lot of uh, the writing conventions and then the, the fantasy conventions around the DFW area uh, where I am. Mm -hmm. I just did a – the last one was World Fantasy Con. Uh, which was down in San Antonio, but that's a moving convention. <laughs> so that was that was my biggest one of the year. But that I've done a you know anywhere from literary uh, conferences, you know, where it's not fans and it's very business and it's like being at a job interview for seventy two hours, <laughs> to you know straight up fan cons where you know you're you're I'll give presentations. Uh, you know I've oh. got you know different costume people in the audience. So, so cause I'll talk to you about <laughs> writing or, um, I started doing some, uh, presentations talking about the RPG social contract and, and that sort of oh, thing. Okay. I, uh, I have a slight advantage over a lot of other authors in that, uh, because my dad forced me into debate when I was in high school, I'm absolutely comfortable speaking in front of a crowd of people. And in the, the writing community, that's a rare thing. Uh, <laughs> I became a writer because I don't want to talk to people. Yeah, so it's like, okay, I'll take this edge that I have. You know, thanks, Dad. <laughs> you found your niche, man. The social writer. That's cool. So you do a lot of uh, speaking and, and uh, like, you know, kind of uh, help for other writers and stuff out there, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, I, I have, I'll talk about how to write fight scenes or... Uh, oh, that's cool. You know, how to... Work your way through the uh, the querying process. Uh, that, so. is, is that like a technical term? There, you mentioned that earlier, and somebody in the chat said querying is like so hard or something. Is that like a? It's a journey through hell, is what it is. <laughs> um, so you sounds you fun. Your, Sign me up. You, you write your book, and you know it's a staggering work of genius. And then you have to do uh, what's called a query letter, which is one page, and you've got about five sentences to sum up what the book is. And then the rest of it is, you know, dear agent so-and-so, and then at the bottom is your writing credits. And you know, like when you look at the, the back of a movie or the description on Netflix, and it kind of sums up Titanic in like three sentences, well, you have to write that for your own book. 
which sucks because it's your baby and you have to like choose which subplots you don't want to talk about and all these characters and you're like, you know, Lord of the Rings is about nine people go across the world to throw away a ring. You're like, that doesn't even encompass the genius of it. It's like, nope, that's all you got. And uh, so you, you send this off to agents and uh, half the time they will not respond. That's their form of rejection, which really does slowly crush you. Yeah, I think I'd rather um, just hear no than just not, you know, have it be out there in the ether. Like, are they still considering it or what? It's like, just, just tell me maybe no. I'll get that, I can think. Maybe I'll get that response now. And you check in your spam folder, <laughs> yeah. slowly withering on the inside. Uh, so you go through that for, for months. Um, my first novel before it sold, I think it's 70 rejections i mean at that point you're like screw it i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna become a painter you know just <laughs> not doing this anymore and uh, but then I, if, if you get an agent they then start trying to sell that to an editor so it's like you know congratulations you hit the halfway point and um so i'm currently going through that process right now so that's why sometimes you, in my videos i might look like really hollow-eyed or something <laughs> Do you ever let that inform? Like, I'm gonna do a really dark video now because I'm in a. I just got a rejection from my query. I um, yeah, I've I, I've, I've had to crush to, your player's souls. <laughs> I've tried to actually keep a lot of like my writing like out of my videos. Okay. You know, it's like, uh, well, I I'm not opposed to talking about it. It's like, okay, I'm gonna do this other thing where I just talk about role playing, and every once in a while I'll kind of mention like, oh yeah, by the way, this is. <laughs> What I am is an author. I'm not. I don't just sit in this room and talk about role playing games every day. Which, really, that is what I do. And uh, <laughs> so, but like my uh, my Black Raven character will have its ten year anniversary coming in February since the first story was published. So I'll nice. have some video about that. And, uh, yeah, I'll probably have some announcements as the new books come out. But yeah, that's so. Gaming is kind of what I do to get away from that. Of as far as uh. I spent so much fantasy time to get with... the fantasy out of your mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, for a while I would try to like have games that were similar to what I was writing. And after I was like, no, I need a total palette yeah. cleanser. Like, you know, so I'm, I'm doing like medieval fantasy guys. We're playing sci-fi. Like, <laughs> I don't want, I don't want any more horses for right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny how people's escapism manifests. Like a lot of the people I play with, it's like, yeah, they're they're not like the most you know successful people. So, like as players, I kind of just let them do what they want. And they usually just end up like doing like they love just like making gold and like buying furniture for their ship that they have and you know all the things that like that. So it's just like, wow, I mean, I can just go shopping and buy whatever I want. Like that's my fantasy. Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I've had an entire game. We did a minstrel game. They were, were traveling minstrels, and somehow or another, we had an entire session that was them just buying clothes. And we had a we had a great time, and it was a ton of role playing. And like, but it was like they're kind of swinging through town, and they go by a tailor shop, and then they're like, "Hey, let's upgrade our wagon, guys, and let's get new instruments." It was like we played shopping for five and a half hours. <laughs> I, I love whenever it. I'm there, I just, I just continuously look around the table and it's like, if they look like they're having fun, then whatever, man, like just run. <laughs> if that's what you want to do, it's fine with me. Yeah. Um, if, if, if they're entertained, go yep. for it. And then, you know, afterwards they're like, Oh man, that was a great session. You just did so great. It's like, I didn't do anything, but sure. I'll take it. Um, we did have a yeah, question that, in the that, chat. Price guy. Yeah, related to publishing, I was actually curious about what your thoughts on this were as well. It's from AJ Kinney says, do you have a lot of experience with self-publishing? Or what do you think about it? Um, I've, I've never self-published. Um, it, it That industry has changed so much. Uh, when I went to my first writing conference, I guess like 2007, 2006, self-publishing were, self-published authors were considered like the unclean. <laughs> you know, at, at the end of this whole thing, they have like classes on how to self-publish your book, and people would kind of go in there, you know, like. <laughs> and, and and then just a few years later, because it's it's blown up, and there's now an entire industries to support it with cover designers and freelance editors and freelance publicists. And then you've got the success stories like Andy Weir's The Martian and, and all those that it does not have the same. Rapid did at all. 
so there's a lot of great resources. I don't see anything wrong with it. You know, I, I, I changed my song on it uh, some years ago. But anyone that does self-publish is going to have a massive upfront overhead because you still need to have a professional editor look at it. Uh, your brain makes it impossible for you to edit your own book because you can't see uh -huh. these errors. Like your brain literally does it in your head and you're blind to them. Uh, but also it's good to have that other pair of eyes because you know what you're supposed to be saying here, but the other eyes look at it and go, I have no idea what you're talking about because you, know, you already knew what you were trying to say. Uh -huh. And then a good cover designer, I'm, I'm actually going to plug a Sean King, uh, sure. who's, who's done my covers. He is, he is a, he is a badass, uh, good cover art, and then hire a, a publicist to kind of help you navigate how to do it. So that's a that's a big upfront cost that self publishing requires. But you know, in today's day and age, uh, a lot of people recoup that really quickly. Also, do audio. Do not neglect audio at all. That's been my that's been my bread and butter. Is um, really. Oh yeah. Uh, I got I got lucky and got a very good narrator early on, but that's the fastest growing market. And I personally listen to 99% of all the books that I read now because I'll go for a walk or I'll do dishes or go to the gym, drive in my car, and I, I pop in my book and I just I just go to town. Huh. So don't neglect it if you self help. Cool. Um, yeah, and actually just to. Uh, you know, for people that might have joined us late, Seth uh, has a number of books, including audiobooks, and the links to his site and Amazon are in the description below. So if you want to go check any of that stuff out, please do so. Um, you know, with uh, being a writer and a gamer and everything, I'm curious, like, do you ever have any desire to create any content for any of the games, Call of Cthulhu or D&D, &D and publish that anywhere? Oh, yeah. Um, I... Uh... I actually have like a few ideas that like I'd like to submit uh, to do. Mm -hmm. uh, my most recent one, which you know, yeah, now now I'm gonna say it and everyone's gonna like take it away from me because somebody that's motivated will do it. We did um, we went to Petra a couple months ago, the uh, uh, in Jordan, a city that's carved into the the mountains. Oh, okay. And I I really want to do a Call of Cthulhu scenario set there that. Um, would take place over uh, it would basically be three adventures. One of them takes place during Roman times, and then another one takes place in like the 1820s when they rediscovered it, and then another one takes place now, where like the same evil oh. surface. And Chaosium did something similar uh, as Dean with the King in Yellow called Ripples from Carcosa, where it's three standalone adventures, but you run the same people through them, and it takes place over the course of 3,000 years. And the characters end up kind of during the course of it realize they're reincarnations of the people that had to deal with this the previous time. I think it's one of the most genius setups because that one was like Roman 1920s and then sci fi by the end where they're in oh, spaceships. Yeah. But they start oh. having memories of when there were Roman legionnaires trying to stop this exact same thing from happening. And uh, so that's what I kind of want to do really cool. with Petra. All right. So uh, don't steal that internet. We got it timestamped here. <laughs> I got it. Um, that I was that I was just thinking of that one uh, Lovecraft story where the guy kept like his mind kept going back to those like a, uh, like ancient aliens, and at the end he just was like, all he could do was have like crab hands because he, <laughs> he was, uh, like his mind got switched with some shadow kind of crab out of time. Is, yeah. I. Uh, I didn't discover Lovecraft until very late three. in life. I, uh, hmm. yeah, people would talk about Lovecraft, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. That's the that's the Squid Face thing. And uh, <laughs> there's a a silent film, Call of Cthulhu film, that the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society did, and that was on Netflix streaming huh. years ago, and I watched it, and it blew my mind. It's a wonderful retelling of it. Um, it's not on streaming anymore, but. Um, it uh, it kind of opened my door to so like, oh, that's what this is about. And then I, because they're all public domain now, and you've got LibriVox that'll do free audio for it. Uh, at the time, I worked at kind of a data entry sort of job, so I would just kind of, I go on YouTube where they have the LibriVox recordings, and I just listen to Lovecraft all day. And finally, I was like, okay, well, this isn't, this is way cooler than I thought it would be. You know? <laughs> 
Yeah, I got into that in uh, high school. Uh, there's a couple of questions here from the chat. I, sorry, I wasn't keeping up with it as good as Dave does. Um, here's a question all gamers must be asked. What's your favorite race class combo? That's from Fergal in Ireland. My favorite race class combo. Okay, I'm 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 ridiculously biased, uh, but we all I uh, going back to my early days of D and D, a a elven mage thief. Nice, can't go wrong there. Right. Yeah. If I was doing D and D again, and somebody said just come up with whatever it is, that's probably the direction I would go. Um, I think with fifth edition now, it would be uh, is it the is it the Sorcerer or the Warlock? can't remember. I played 5th edition for one year, but it's been two years since ah. then. So, like, I didn't Sorcerer's the one memory. with the metamagic, and Warlock's the one that uses Eldritch Blast all the time. <laughs> Warlock. <laughs> <laughs> Where they make the pact with the, with the Cthulhu. Well, um, that's, a, that's like the Witch class in 1st edition. It was in Dragon Magazine, October of 1986. That's how much useless trivia I have in my head. <laughs> I remember that. And it was it was almost the exact same, and I love that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. I often I, I can't go that it's like I'll remember that something was in Dragon, but I couldn't couldn't cite you the uh, the uh, issue. Probably Here's the only a question. Way I can do that too. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a question from Underwood Sketches. How old were you when you? How old were you when you got serious about writing? Serious. I was about twenty two, twenty three. Um, about. It was about within a year of me graduating college that I started. So I, I went to college for radio, TV, film. Mm. Promptly did not go into those fields because uh, my, my professors for years, the whole time, were like, you know, there is no money in radio, right? You will be poor for the rest of your life. And like, I think my last semester of college, it dawned on me, I'm like, oh my God, they're being serious. <laughs> I ended up going into like, I ended up going into finance. And uh, so. <laughs> Then I, I started writing very seriously um, after college, but I didn't actually take any courses on it. So it was like making my YouTube videos. I started off really raw and horrible, and I will never, ever let anyone see the, the first couple years of the stuff that I wrote because it was bad. You can, you can make it like a Patreon reward if you ever make one of those. Like, if you give me $1,000 a month, you can see my original <laughs> stuff. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> not, there's no price. That could rule. <laughs> Um, here's a question from Stitch Heel Chemist. Is there a game system you've wanted to try out but haven't had a chance yet? Oh, God. Um, okay, so I've, I've wanted to check out the new Shadowrun. Uh, I, I grew up playing a lot of um, uh, Cyberpunk 2020 in their interlock system. Mm -hmm. So the Shadowrun, I, I really wanted to, I've seen their book, and it's like that thick. Is oh, really? Their, their new rule book? Mm -mm. It, I, I, will, I will make one criticism of it. I have never found a Shadowrun book in the wild that was not coming apart under its own weight because there is, it's so thick that the weight of the paper actually starts peeling off the spine. But um, So I would actually love to give that a whirl, but I don't want to, like, commit that rule system to memory just to test it out. Like, I just want to, like, sit down with a group of guys and be like, have them hand me a character and go, okay, here we go. But, uh, uh, I've heard a lot of people use a cipher system to run Shadowrun. I used to play Shadowrun in high school. I, I don't remember it being all that clunky, maybe because I was just a player, so it was just like, you know, the DM <laughs> just tells you what to roll, so, yeah, okay, I'll just grab a bunch of D6s and whatever. You know, but, what's uh, weird is when you come in as a player and the DM, if the DM's been playing it a while, you don't know how many house rules that you're really being subjected to. Uh, yeah, right. When I started playing Dungeons and Dragons, it's like 91, 92, and my DM had been playing since the 70s. He was a friend of mine's dad. So I didn't know that all the weapon speed and all the weird first edition yes, rules. that stuff is very weird, right? And, and then I remember like, yeah, I found out about him, and like he was like, "Yeah, don't we don't talk about that? Just you know, skip that." Then in second edition, near the end, they came up with combat and tactics add-on where they brought that back. And I, I had players that we were because we were playing secondy at the time. I was like, "Man, we should do that." It's like, guys, I got some bad news. That has always been here, <laughs> yeah. and we are not doing that because that that gets really overly complicated really fast. And I prefer combat that is just quick. You know, keep the combat going. 
fighting versus you spend like 30 minutes to go through one round. Mm-hmm. It, you know, so whoever you're talking to is excited, but then you've got your other players that are just twiddling their thumbs so you can get around. It's like, now I want fast and dirty yeah, combat. Yeah, we never, we never used that. And I was, I was actually flipping through the first edition uh, player's handbook a couple months ago, and I was like, well, what is this weapon speed? I don't remember ever even using this at all. It's like, yeah, if you have a battle axe, but the enemy has a dagger, then your initiative is plus two. And it's like, but if they have a spear, then you're minus three. And it's like, it just you're like every round, you'd be like switching weapons. It's like rock, paper, scissors on steroids, <laughs> almost. Well, like, it was like, like crossbows could penetrate plate mail better than <laughs> arrows. And all. It was like, it was, it was, it was kind of brilliant, but at the same time, like, I'm not a supercomputer. Like, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, did people like, really play like this? It would have taken, like you were saying, like they'd take forever to do a combat. <laughs> so, and, and I think everyone skips that rule. Like I've, I've never met anyone that, that, that played it, Space, or at least admitted yeah, they played factor, it. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I thought I saw another question in here. Nope. Oh, just talking to each other about gaming. Um, oh, I remember, yes, uh, I'd read that you're, you know, really interested in travel and that uh, Florence is your favorite city. Does that, mm-hmm. does your travel inspire your games at all? Do you ever go to a place like, I'm going to put that, uh, maybe, I guess uh, that Petra kind of, you mentioned earlier. Well, it, um, uh, it did with my, my, my books, um, uh, with my Black Raven character, I wrote one story and it was this origin story and I intended to never touch that character again. I wanted to have this kind of open ending where you know, goes off and will he be great or will he not? And then uh, we went to Venice uh, a few years later and Venice really struck me. So I decided to write a story there. It's like, I'm going to take that same character and put him in. And then, you know, 20 more stories followed shortly after that. But uh, (laughs) because I, I, and the thing is it doesn't have to be anywhere traveling exotic. I think when you go somewhere that you're just not used to, you pay a lot more attention to just small details, and that's where I find my inspiration. So, yeah, because if I if I walk the streets of my own town, I, I I've seen those trees a million times. My brain doesn't register them. But if I came up and I visited you, I would notice absolutely everything on the street, and I would have all this little inspiration. And then if it's even more removed from what I'm used to, uh, you notice more and more, and that's that's really where it comes from, or just sometimes those tiny details that you find fun. So I, so I love new Orleans, but yeah, it's like, it's so strange <laughs> that you notice everything. So, um, so we, uh, you know, we had talked a little bit, um, offline about, uh, you're starting to get a paranoia game together. Is that when are you going to be playing that? Uh, we will be playing that Sunday. Oh, okay. Is so, that game uh, day for you guys? Sundays? Uh, well, um, normally we play Saturdays. We play from like, Two o'clock until midnight ish. Wow, one nice. One game a month, but they're they're power long games. Mm-hmm. But the first hour reserved for all of us to catch up and, and, and BS. And yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah. it's not like we're solid gaming. And people have asked like, why don't you stream your games? Like there's like three hours worth of conversation about our, our kids and mm-hmm. you know, stuff. Yeah, when you're yeah. live gaming, it's like, yeah, just keep going, man. Yeah. Griping about our day jobs. And mm-hmm. uh, so but this one, I'm actually pulling some people in that I don't normally game with because it's a good excuse. And uh, we're going to try to run this, the new uh, Paranoia that Mongoose Publishing did. So I've, I've, been, I've been reading through it. It looks fun. We'll see, we'll see how we can do it. Uh, it's always weird to try a new system because as the game master, I'm kind of not positive on the rules. You know, I know them, but I don't rapid fire know them. Yeah, and then and then my players don't know them, so there's that kind of big curve at first, where it's like, okay, we start combat, and everyone's like, okay, how do how do we do initiative? How do we how do we do anything? So yeah, it's weird uh, how ingrained certain games can get. You know, obviously, like I, you know, we, we both have D and D in common. And it's like if you've never played before, I guess it could be clunky and weird, like. You know, even the ability scores are between three and eighteen. It's like why those numbers are like when you never even reference them aside from the modifier they give you. But like to me, that makes sense. But then you play a new game, even if it's like a better system. It's like I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I, I'm playing in two games live right now. I don't even know how to play this Star <laughs> Trek Adventures and uh, <laughs> Marvel Superheroes, the old '80s game we play on Monday nights. 
And it's like, I don't know how to play either of those games. I'm just like, hey, this is what I want to do. And they're like, okay, roll these dice. So, like you were saying earlier with the house rules. And so it's like, that might be the rules as written, or it's just what they're saying at the time. So I have no clue. Well, it's, it's probably, it's like, one of the things like I love about 5th edition D&D is they streamlined it so much. Oh, because yeah. I had, I had played first and second edition for so long that I wasn't even cognizant anymore of how weirdly complicated it was. Like to me, it was just natural. But then when like, you look back now, it's like, whoa! How like, was I doing this oh as a wow! Kid? Was, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when I was I was thirteen and my brain was thirsty and soaking up all this information, man, I got those rules down like that. And, you know, now when now when we're older, I'm looking back like, God, that was like rocket science trying to this figure is- out how to do that combat. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but something about 5th edition, it just kind of like, it's like the best parts you remember from all the other editions. Except well, it, it, not as clunky. Well, I remember our very first game of it, we didn't have to pull out the rule book once to, to reference. It's like, okay, that's, yeah, right? that is about as solid of a recommendation I could ever give a system. Mm-hmm. Is I mean, I studied it before we played, but there was never like a Hold on, let's yeah. figure out how to do that. It was like, no, no, we we got this. You know, we did a few things wrong and we corrected it. Um, but I, I think the past few years, now that you've got a generation that grew up playing that is now in charge of writing, they kind of came in with a very different viewpoint than the old watch had that were kind of coming up with it. You know, nobody had done this before. Yeah. So now you've got a you know, generation of experience that's coming in going. This is how we should do it to make it smooth, and it's it's very beautiful. <laughs> the the new games that are coming out because of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not just you know, I mean, not just D and D. Yeah, there's just so many innovative and like quick moving games that are coming out anymore. It's a great time to be a nerdy gamer, that's for sure. Yeah. Well. So yeah, we're coming up on the hour mark. Um, so I guess we'll uh, start wrapping things up and see if there's any other questions in here. Somebody says, you're still playing Paranoia? I love that game. The computer is their buddy. That's John <laughs> Laughlin. He's trying to win faith. Yeah, I've never actually played it, but I know enough about it. Like, the computer's kind of, like, controlling everything, right? And you're, like, clones of yeah, yourself uh, to appease the computer. You were, you were living in an, uh, an underground complex of, you know, never defined huge size and the computer is in charge and you have six clones. So when you die, you can come back six times. The, the new paranoia gave the best description of the computer ever because you used to be able to find it as it was evil or malicious. It is, do you remember Clippy from Windows? Yeah. That, that annoying little bastard <laughs> that, you know, that was always trying to help and screwed it up every time. They're like, imagine if Clippy was all powerful and, and could have you executed... <laughs> But at the same time, believed it was infallible. And okay, that so, sounds fun. So I'm looking forward to this next game. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna run this the way. Like, what would Clippy do? What is the most annoying? Like, are you trying to be in a fight? Would you like to have the survey to like help you through a fight? You know, <laughs> that sounds awesome. It, it'll throw up a pop up in your field of vision, so you now can't see what's going on as the computers. <laughs> trying to assist you or maybe it'll try to pull you like how would you rate your your you know fight experience on one through five with this short <laughs> survey and if people shooting at you yeah you know, oh, that sounds fun as heck <laughs> are you gonna uh, do you have are you gonna do any videos about paranoia that sounds like a pretty cool uh game set I, I will i will probably do one over the system and then one over uh, uh some of the adventures we're gonna do okay uh, i'm gonna kind of see that uh Depends how it goes. But ultimately, you know, it's kind of motivating me to actually get around to playing it is now that I do reviews. It's like, I need content. I Right now I could talk about D&D and Call of Cthulhu all day. But, like, what else is out there? There's so much. So yeah. it's kind of a, it's a great excuse to grab my buddies and go, hey, guys, we're going to test drive this. So Cool. So anything you would like to leave uh, our viewers with today before we before we sign off? Yeah, you know, not much. Uh, my my Black Raven series did just get re-released through Crossroad Press. So if there's some any fans of pulpy sword and sorcery thief stuff, check those out. And um, other than that, you know, show up on the channel, see what see it, and and leave some comments. I like the dialogues versus you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me just talking to myself. So yeah, so you uh, 
like Seth said, like go check out his channel, watch the videos, like like, comment, and subscribe on his favorite ones or on your favorite ones. And uh, again, if you're at PAX Unplugged this weekend and you spot Nerd Ark, it's Dave or Ted or Nate the Nerd Ark in the crowd, go say hello and uh, don't tackle Ted, even though Dave, Dave Wise wants you to tackle Ted. But you can challenge him to a sword duel though, because he is he is a, an accomplished swordsman. But uh, and also, like I said, we got that Xanathar's Guide to Everything contest going on, so you can find the link to that and any of the Xanathar's Guide flip-throughs. There's a week left on that, so you can win. There's two up for grabs, the Special Edition and the uh, Standard Edition cover. And again, go check out Phyllis Seth on Twitter. Check out his website. Uh, visit Amazon. You can find all his books and um, audio books. And uh, keep an eye on what he's got going on. And uh, until next time, everybody, stay nerdy. You.